please. Our last speaker of the day is another total force leader. It's clear during his leadership as Chief of Staff of the Air Force that he has advocated for the total force. He's another leader who demonstrates daily in his actions those values, in this case the Air Force values, not just again for us in uniform but for all of the men and women out there in our nation. It's our privilege to have the Chief of Staff of the Air Force, General Goldfein, here with us this afternoon. The Chair recognizes the Sergeant at Arms. The Sergeant at Arms announces the presence in the chamber of General David L. Goldfein, the Chief of Staff of the Air Force. He is escorted by Lieutenant General L. Scott Rice, the Director of the Air National Guard, Major General Donald Dunbar, the Vice Chair Air of the National Guard Association of the United States, and Major General Gary W. Keith, a member of the Board of Directors of the National Guard Association of the United States and the Adjutant General of Massachusetts. Our Chief of Staff of the Air Force, General David Goldfein. Well, thank you and good afternoon. I, I love following my buddy, General Mark Milley. And uh, I just want to say that, you know, a couple thank yous to him. First of all, you know, we're, uh, we're putting forward legis legislation to actually build the Air Army Corps again. <laughs> and I do want to thank the Army for wear testing our new Air Force uniform, the OCPs. <laughs> but in actuality, there's some method behind the madness. Because our two services fight together. Our two services are embedded together. And so it makes perfect sense that we look the same as we go into battle together, just as have we have throughout our history. A couple of uh, groups that I want to recognize. Uh, first, I know there are a number of spouses here, and I want to thank you. You represent a very special kind of courage when you endure the long hours, the hardship, the separations that have become so much a part of military service. I think personally you're the best deal our nation gets. And my wife, Dawn, every once in a while. You know, she'll ask me, she says, hey, I haven't seen my paycheck lately. So to our spouses, thank you so much for what you do for us every day. And then I'd also like to point out uh, and, and a shout out to our many retirees who are here in the audience. You know, those of us, <laughs> you know, those of us privileged to wear a uniform today, we enjoy the trust and confidence of a grateful nation. We can't go five steps in an airport without somebody walking up to us, you know, wanting to buy a cup of coffee or thanking us for our service. And, and it's on us, the onus is on us, for those of us privileged to serve today, to remind ourselves that we enjoy that trust, not only before what we do, but for the Air Force and the Army we were handed. And I still remember back to times post-Vietnam with my dad who came out of flying fighters in Udorn and the way he was treated. And so for our retirees who stayed in our services and rebuilt this Air Force and rebuilt this Army, as your Chief of Staff, I just want to say thank you. <laughs> so
So I'm going to start and talk a little bit about, about teamwork and the teams that I'm privileged to work with every day. And I want you to know that General Catfish Rice, there is no better friend on the planet, not only for our Air National Guardsmen, for our Army Guardsmen, and for all airmen, there is no better friend on the planet than Catfish Rice. I've learned to greatly appreciate not only his operational savvy, but he is a trusted, confident, and someone I'm proud to call a friend. And you need to know that there is no error between the two of us when it comes to where we're moving this Air Force forward. So Catfish, again, thank you very much. And maybe just a moment about uh, Lieutenant General Mary Ann Miller, commander of our Air Force Reserve. She's an individual that I can't, I don't know if I can give a better compliment to any fellow general officer than to say, you know, every day I'm with her, she inspires me and she makes me want to be a better chief. She makes me want to be a better airman. And I'm proud to tell you that in two weeks, I will promote her to four-star general and she will be the first citizen airman to be a four-star major command in the United States Air Force since our history. So a year ago, if you can roll to the next slide, a year ago, I asked the senior leadership of the Air Force a couple of key questions. I said, who do we need to be in 2030? And what's standing in our way? Because if we go to war this year, we will likely go to war with the service that General John Jumper and Secretary Jim Roche built. Such is the nature of time. I'm the 21st Chief of Staff. Chief 24, my successor, Chief 24, will take the Air Force to war in 2030. And if he takes the Air Force to war in 2030, he or she will take that with the Air Force that General Goldfein and Secretary Wilson built. So the question I ask is, who do we need to be in 2030? Not, not uh, what do we need to do, fly, fight, and win. Not where do we need to do it in air, space, and cyber. But who do we need to be as an institution that can win in 2030? And what's standing in our way? We all know that we've been fighting, whether you want to count 27 years or 17 years, we've been supporting a rather mature fight over the past 17 years. And all the services have made strategic trades. And some of our muscles are actually pretty cut because we've been working them steadily over the last 17 years in a certain kind of fight. But some muscles have atrophied. And so a year ago, I asked these two questions. And as a service chief responsible for organizing, training, and equipping, I looked at three focus areas where I knew we needed to strengthen our muscle to ensure that we were prepared as a service to contribute to multi-domain operations in an era where we've returned to peer competition. And I learned long ago from a boss of mine, a guy named General Mike Ryan, if you're going to move an organization, you have to have three things. First, you have to have a single person in charge. Committees and groups don't actually solve things. You got to have an individual that's accountable, that's given authority, that's given responsibility for delivering success. The second thing you have to have is a plan, a written plan, written in English with few acronyms that the organization can actually understand and move forward on. And the third thing you have to do is place that on a calendar with an implementation plan that has measures of effectiveness so that when life gets in the way of the perfect plan, you know you're moving the organization forward. So in the organize and the train and the equip piece of our Air Force, we focused on three areas, 
Each of these led by a brigadier general with a team. Each of these teams that went out went over to 75 bases, literally interviewed thousands of airmen, and produced written plans for me over the course of this past year. And in the organized piece of our business, we focused on the fundamental fighting organization of the United States Air Force, which is a squadron. And when we looked at, went out and looked at what is the current state of our fighting formation, our squadrons, and how do we revitalize them for a war in the 21st century? We looked at how do we develop the leaders we need to be able to look at the complex operating environment that we are involved in and to be able to bring creative solutions to complex challenges in an era where we return to peer competition. And in the equip side of the house, we looked at how do we connect this force together? How do we network this force so that we can solve the hardest piece of multi-domain operations, which is the command and control piece? As the CFAC in Central Command, working with General Milley, working for then General Mattis, I actually went into the job thinking my role would be to place the right assets overhead, to un understand the ground force commander's intent, and to make sure that we had the right attributes in place to support the campaign. And while we did that, I also realized that what I did every day for Secretary Mattis was to provide him operational level command and control. Because it was at the Combined Air Operations Center that many of you have been to, where we pull together all elements of the joint team, not just small liaison groups, but robust members from each component. And all of our allies, our, our allies and partners and members of the coalition. And it was there at this operational level headquarters that we built the integrated plan to be able to execute combat operations across the region. And so it made perfect sense to me, as the service that brings that kind of capability, that we would take on some of this hardest operational challenge of multi-domain ops and look at the business of command and control. While we were moving out on these to build the plan, to lay this on a calendar, to build the implementation plan, Secretary Mattis came on board and started the journey of building, as he referred to this morning, the National Defense Strategy. By the time it was signed, we were on version 67, I believe. It was a completely inclusive environment. And as Joint Chiefs, he took our inputs. And because it was inclusive and we had these parallel efforts going on, what we had going on in each of these focus areas was feeding into the National Defense Strategy. And what was going on within the National Defense Strategy was, was feeding into our focus areas. And so today, there are no, there's no air between us. And so what I wanted to do today is to report out to you what we've accomplished over the course of this past year, where we're headed, and perhaps tie it all together for you in a new concept of warfighting, which we called multi-domain operations. So let's go to the next slide. So revitalizing squadrons. Again, why squadrons? Fundamental fighting organization of the United States Air Force. It's where airmen arrive after tech school. It's where innovation occurs. It's where the mission succeeds or fails. It's the level of command where commanders have the most impact on the airmen entrusted to their care. And we looked at and are updating all of the mission directives as we focus on the mission of a squadron, the purpose of a squadron. Because here's what we found. I did an unscientific survey, which is code for I called my dad. <laughs> I said, hey, dad. I said, hey, you know, when you were flying uh, F-86s back in 64, I mean, how long did it take you to to plan, brief, execute, debrief a typical mission. And he said, ah, about five hours, maybe seven. And then I went in about 10 year increments and went to different weapon systems and asked the same question. And what I found was that about the time we started bringing on fourth generation airplane that were software upgradable, we went from linear mission expansion 
to almost exponential mission expansion. And at that same time, we went from large mission planning cells and mission planning areas to having more and more missions go into secure areas and vaults, which means less folks were available to actually help with mission planning. And as missions expanded and security levels became higher, at the same time, we got much smaller as an Air Force. If I'd been standing to, and talking to you as the chief in 1990 when we deployed for Desert Shield, I would have been speaking to an Air Force of just shy of one million active guard and reserve. Today, we're a grand total of 670,000 of us. If I'd been standing here in 1990, I would have been talking to an Air Force of 134 fighter squadrons, to give you one example, of which 34 deployed to take part in Desert Storm. Today, across the active guard and reserve, we have a grand total of 55. If I'd been here in 1990, I would have been talking to an Air Force that had over 9,000 airplanes. Today, we have a little over 5,000. As we got smaller and missions expanded and securities went, levels went up, guess what we did to change the makeup of a typical squadron over that 40 year period. Today's squadrons in the United States Air Force look a lot like they did in 1964. So it's time for us to look at the mission directives, the unit manning documents, and upgrade our squadrons to 21st century warfare. At the same time we got smaller, organizations often do this. You consolidate your manpower, and then when it's too small for a lower level of the organization, you consolidate and move it up. And so we have huge pockets of our Air Force where we actually no longer have the manning that we had at squadron level and we moved it up to group and to wing. And the unintended consequence of those moves is that as people moved out, the duties remained. And those duties remained on a smaller force. And decision authority moved out and up as well. And so today, we are working to push decision authority back down where it belongs, to squadron command. Because not only do we train like we fight, we fight like we train. And in the fight that's coming, I need squadron commanders. For those of you who are here, I need squadron commanders who have the decision authority today so that when I send you forward to a base in a contested environment, and I ask you to operate, perhaps cut off from some part of the network, and not having exquisite connectivity and intelligence and the ability to get higher headquarters guidance, I need you to be able to operate from mission command and execute operations. And I can only do that if I restore decision authority today in daily operations. And we are removing impediments. And this one, we're taking a chapter actually out of the Air National Guard and following your lead. The Secretary and I have got an ax and we're, and we're swinging away at this. And this is all those things that have become irritants to restoring the readiness of our force. This is additional duties that remained in the squadron level and the group and the wing level that don't actually contribute directly to combat capability and readiness. We're going after them. In the Secretary's office, we have a stack, a growing stack of Air Force instructions. There are 1,300 of them today. I'm not sure at what point, as a commander, you just hit the I believe button. But 1,300 prescriptive, overly prescriptive Air Force instructions are not required to do our business. So we are swinging away at them. And we're swinging away at them. One of the, one of the main reasons is that we fundamentally, the Secretary and I fundamentally, absolutely trust our commanders. We raised our commanders, and we give them the authority and the responsibility for the most destructive weaponry on the planet. We can trust our commanders to make daily decisions with that overly prescriptive Air Force instruction. We're going.
and we're going after a computer-based training. You know, I have a daughter that's in the Air Force, and so she, uh, she, keeps, me, uh, she keeps me grounded, right? She has, I give her credit for this quote. She says, Dad, you know, I don't know what hell looks like, but I know I'll be there. I know I'm there if I have to, if I have to file a voucher on DTS to get out. <laughs> right? And then do 60 hours of computer-based training. So we're going after it. Because it's at the squadron level that we're going to succeed or fail as an Air Force. And if you're a squadron commander in this room, I hope you feel that. We're pushing you resources. There's not a lot of strings attached to this money that we're pushing you to get at those readiness requirements that you have. Because you know where you need the resources. My job as your chief is to get them to you and get out of your way. Purposeful leadership. If there's one thing that we're going to do that's going to have the largest impact, based on the recognition that it is squadron command that's going to have the most impact on our ability to accomplish our mission, it's to develop and place inspirational commanders in command of the greatest treasure in our nation's arsenal, which is the young men and women who signed up to serve. And so for wing commanders, Hopefully you've gotten, you're receiving the notes from me where I've said, hey, I, I really look forward to getting out and seeing your flight commander schools. Because it's at flight commander that I expect you to first identify those who you believe have the highest potential to go on to command at our most foundational level, the squadron. And once you identify them, we're going to compete them and send them to a foundational course. We've run our first one. We have one more beta test to do in October, and the first one starts in January. And we're going to run 13 over the course of a year. And we're going to take the airmen that you've identified that have potential to command at squadron level, and we're going to put them through the foundational course. And if we get this right, they won't come out of the course believing they have everything they need. They will come out of the course hungry for more. And then we will offer them, and we will offer you as commanders who know your people, development and educational opportunities to prepare them for this most essential level of command. And then just prior to taking the flag, they will go through a MAGCOM commander's top-off course. And we will have given them every tool they need to have the best chance to succeed wildly in this most important level of command. Secretary Mattis talked about fitness. Chief Milley talked about fitness. I will just tell you that fit squadrons are more lethal squadrons. And it's my expectations that commanders, senior NCOs, first sergeants are the leaders in this endeavor as we ensure that we are fit for the fights that's coming. And esprit de corps. I'm an unapologetic airman. We led the great insurgency of 1947. <laughs> but seriously, our organization and our culture of an airman, we work hard, we play hard. And I want to make sure that within that most foundational level of command, where the culture of the Air Force resides, that we're getting the mission done, that leaders are inspiring airmen, and that we're taking time to celebrate this opportunity that we have to make a difference, to work with, to our right and to our left, the finest people on the planet and to make this world a better place for our kids and for our grandkids. Let's go to the next slide. Joint leaders and teams. So organize folks on, on squadrons. This is about the development of the leaders that we need to be able to fight and win in the 21st century. And there's three elements of a leader development. There, is, there are those experiences that we have, normally based on assignments that we have. There are those education op educational opportunities we have. And then there are the networks that we build 
so that we have a brain trust that we can call upon to be able to help us bring creative solutions to complex challenges. So what we're doing across the Air Force now is we are standing up an organization within our personnel system and our Air Force Personnel Center to track joint assignments and to look at those assignments that actually expose us to the operational art. The operational art that starts with understanding how air, space, cyber, and our capabilities within the United States Air Force come together to be able to support an operational plan. And then how our capabilities actually nest with joint capabilities at land, on land and at sea. And then how our military capabilities actually nest with those other elements of government that to actually then, then come together to be able to execute, execute a, global, a global campaign. To be able to develop those leaders, we have to look at the incentive structure, and we are across our Air Force. And one of the things that we're looking at, taking a hard look at, is our officer promotion system. And we're starting off with the dialogue that begins, what is it that we value? What core competencies do we value? What elements of character do we value? And does our system of promotion reward against what we value? And does that promotion system incentivize the behaviors that we want to build the leaders of the future? Gone are the days where we can have the majority of our Air Force stay well within a, a specific tribe and rise all the way up to the ranks of general officer before we expose them to the operational art. So tracking of key joint experiences to ensure that we earlier in a career expand our thinking is central to who we are as an Air Force and where we're going. We fight through JTFs through components and joint task forces. If you take a look at history, about six weeks from a crisis to the stand-up of a JTF, we then come to, together as joint teammates to be able to organize under a commander and staff, and we execute humanitarian to combat operations. Six weeks. So we as a service have got to ensure that we are prepared when called upon to plug in, understand the lexicon, understand the battle rhythm, and can join and lead a joint task force. To be able to do that, in December of this year, we will have certified 9th Air Force headquarters at Shaw Air Force Base as a joint task force headquarters with a core staff, with a deployable command and control capability to be able to lead and or support and plug in to a JTF. This is the IP demo, the instructor demo. As we refine and complete this effort that's been ongoing now for a year and a half, we will apply that to our other numbered Air Forces to ensure that a component numbered Air Force in the United States Air Force has the capability to lead and or plug in and support a JTF on day one of the JTF. And we are looking at echelons of command from the squadron to the group to the wing and to the component numbered Air Force to ensure that the commanders we raise and the teams that we raise to lead those echelons of command have what they need to be able to fight and win. And we are looking at and refining the way we deploy forces forward. Over 17 years, our footprint in the Middle East actually has not changed. Through all of the surges, ups and downs, the air component has actually stayed relatively stable. And I believe the future looks about the same over time, based on maintaining campaign momentum against violent extremism. So if that's our footprint over time, what we have done as an Air Force is we looked across every wing in the United States Air Force and we took some portion of it. And on any given time, I can go to any one of the wings represented here and there's some portion of your force that's always deployed. 
And we've gotten to a point where the average deployment model goes down to very often one airman. And we could do that because we would roll in on a mature fight. But in the fight we're preparing for, whether that be in Russia, China, Iran, North Korea, we've got to be prepared to be able to roll forward with squadrons that are intact fighting units, with commanders who have decision authority today so they can execute it in the, in the future, with joint leaders that understand the business of joint warfighting and the operational art and that every echelon of command has what it takes to be able to lash up together to execute multi-domain operations. Next slide. And multi-domain C2. There are three elements that we are focused on. And we do this not for the air component, but we do this as a member of the joint team. There's a new operating concept that we're looking at to be able to pull together capabilities in ways that allow us to provide multiple dilemmas for an adversary that they, can, they, just, can't, uh, they just can't counter. And so we're looking at war games. This October, we'll have our first Doolittle war game that will be focused on command and control and bringing together the networking of elements and capabilities to be able to execute multi-domain operations. We're looking at our training venues. We're looking at our ranges. We're looking at our investment in the ability to replicate high-end threats, whether that be at Nellis or NTC or virtually, to ensure that we can train to a higher level in this business of peer competition. We're building a shadow network to be able to try out many of our operational concepts so that we have a network capability to tie together platform sensors and weapons to be able to bring multiple dilemmas and multiple capabilities to bear on an adversary. And we're looking at our C2 experts to make sure that we raise a core cadre of folks who understand the business of C2. A year ago when I laid out these and, and we got on this path, I talked about this coming together, organize, train, equip, fix your fighting formation, develop the leaders you need for the future, and pull it all together through command and control capabilities that networks your force. But I didn't have the, the concept of operations that ties it all together. And over the course of this year, each of the Joint Chiefs has been pursuing what I believe is a very similar path, but we've been calling it different things. General Milley, General Neller have been working on multi-domain battle and the concepts associated with that. And we've been there with them uh, throughout between TRADOC and Air Combat Command. Admiral Richardson has been looking at data lakes and a net-centric Navy. And I've been looking at multi-domain command and control. But now we're pulling it all together into this concept of multi-domain operations. Let's go to the next slide. But it causes, it requires us to think a little bit differently about this future force. This is the Air Force today. There's a lot of platforms, a lot of sensors, and a lot of weapons. And most of us in this room can find something on this slide and personally associate ourselves with it. Let's go to the next slide. This is the Air Force of 2030. It actually looks a lot like the Air Force of 2018. Much of the platform sensors and weapons that we have today will be there tomorrow. There's some new things on there. I love the picture of the TX. Nobody can say I'm giving anything away there, right? The question for us, though, especially as airmen, is can we look at this picture and not see platforms, sensors, and weapons, but actually see nodes in a network that we need to tie together in different ways so that we can come after an adversary in all domains simultaneously. Next slide. So in me, to me, this is about connecting three grids. We sense the globe in six domains, air, land, sea, space, cyber. 
and we bring together reams and volumes of data that allow us to understand an operational environment. And so our job with multi-domain operations is to, is to tie these together in a way that we understand more than our adversary and we deny him the same. And then we pull together the, the, the decision grid, which allows us to make better, faster decisions on how we employ forces to the future. And then we create effects in multiple domains in ways an adversary cannot maintain and an adversary can't keep up with. It was interesting that the example is already used of, uh, of, of uh, Lexicon and Concord. So I'm going to use the same example, but I'll use it a little bit differently. So if we remember in part of the story there in 1775 is that as the British were marching from Boston, they had one of two avenues of approach. They could go by land or they could cross the river. And so therein lied the great ride, right? One if by land, two if by sea. And so when you think about this, one lantern hung if by land, two if by sea, what if the British were able to split their forces and come through both land and sea? What would the colonists have had to do? Would they have had to split their forces? What kind of a dilemma would have that made? Would they have had to cede one path and only defend against the other? One if by land, two if by sea, three if by air, four if by space, five if by cyber. How many lanterns does our adversary need to purchase if, in fact, we can use all domains that we have dominance in to be able to bring capabilities together in ways they can never counter? And can we do that at a way that actually becomes 21st century deterrence going forward? And so this idea of multi-domain operations is, is how we as a global superpower with a global military actually think and operate globally. But if someone's pressuring us from one particular direction or one particular domain, we have four, five, six domains we can throw at them. And we can connect them up in different ways that today are not connectable. Because we've taken this force that we have and build the networking capabilities that we need to allow future soldiers, sailors, airmen, marines to be able to operate at a pace that an adversary could never counter. This is what I believe has been laid out by the national defense strategy. And by revitalizing our squadrons, by ensuring that we have our fighting formations and echelons of command connected, and that they understand their roles and we're developing the leaders we need to be able to command those organizations. And then we have the networked capability across our Air Force to be able to do multi-domain operations. That, to me, is the Air Force the nation needs. That's who we need to be in 2030. I don't know what we will put in the bomb bay of a B-21. But I believe the idea is in this room. And my job as chief is to set the environment where that idea can get a hearing. Last slide. I love this quote from Hap Arnold. The next war may be fought by airplanes with no men in them at all. This is in 1945. It'll be different from anything the world has ever seen. For the Air Force, this is a 1945 moment. And I believe we put the pieces and parts in place to be able to move this forward. And I'll end with this. I have the privilege and the honor not to have talked about any of this relative to active guard or reserve because we are truly one Air Force. And everything I've talked about applies to all of us going forward. It's an honor to serve with each and every one of you. Thank you very much.
sir. Are you okay? We'll take questions. Sure. All right. Uh, sir, to your to your right. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Chief. Um, Brigadier General Mookie Walker from the great state of West Bygon, Virginia. Yeah. As you know, there's a, the pilot shortage is not just an Air Force problem, it's not just a DOD problem, it's yeah. not just an American problem, it's a worldwide problem. Now when pilots leave the active duty, the Guard does its best to try and capture and preserve that talent and experience. And we also like to retain our own Guardsmen, even through the MDS conversions. We'd like to ask your help on something, however. Uh, when we try to recruit J model, Herc drivers to legacy Hercs, we feel that the, the conversion training may be a little bit excessive. And similarly, the prescribed training for KC-46s may be excessive for some of our airmen who, are, uh, who have vast experience in 767. Some of them captains, some of them Czech airmen. Now, with that, with that uh, what we call excessive training, sometimes we're not able to recruit those people. We're not able to keep our people through the conversions. So can we come together and find a better way? Yeah, no, I think that's, uh, I love taking taskers. I got one. <laughs> um, here's what's interesting, too, about your question. We're taking a completely new look. You know, we actually haven't changed the way we produce pilots in a number of years. Um, you may have seen the, some of the work that we're doing on UPT Next, Undergraduate Pilot Training Next, right? We're, we're taking a, you know, I mean, for most of us who grew up flying, learned to fly, right? I mean, I remember chair flying, right? Chair flying was, you had two plungers, right? And a, and a poster on the wall, and that's how you, you know, practice. Now we can put somebody, uh, they have simulators that you can buy commercially, they're available to them, right? You can put the goggles on, you can actually go fly your missions and you can actually type in the whatever airplane that you want to fly, and you can go fly it, right, virtually. And so now what we're finding is that there are different ways of training that are actually accelerating, and, and we're looking at the way people learn. And, you know, our model that most of us grew up with was, right, everybody started as a class, and you ended as a class, right? So if you happen to be the fastest person in the class, you had to wait for everybody else. If you were the slowest person in the class, right, then uh, you, were, you were the one everybody was waiting for. But you had to all, you know, the whole class had to graduate on time. That actually doesn't make much sense for a nation that needs more pilots, right? So we're taking a look at uh, that scrapping that model and getting folks so that they're ready to proficiency advance and we move them forward. Um, we're also looking at this beyond pilot training though. We're looking at it in places like cyber, right? Because we started in the cyber business using this, the UPT model, right? Everybody that came in would get the exact same training regardless of your background. And we got folks that come into the cyber business, especially guard reserve, who in their civilian job are actually, you know, security managers for major companies. And we're putting them through Cyber 101. <laughs> I mean, they could teach half, half, if not more than the course. So I do think that we can get at this. I do think there are different ways that we can go about it. And I'll take that as a tasker uh, to go take a look, especially at those two weapon systems. Thank you, sir. Thank you. I'll take one to the far left. Hi, sir. Hi. Uh, Major Jody Schweiker from Ohio. Um, so, <laughs> um, my question, sir, is um, let me scroll down to it. I'm sorry, I have a lot of notes here. Um, is that you talked a lot about changing leadership and training, especially at the squadron level. Um, but one of the things that I think a lot about is um, in the interest of diversity and due to pilot shortages and diversity of thought and you know backgrounds and everything, is anyone considering allowing non-rated officers at any point to become wing commanders? Um, I don't know to you know if we were trained in the mission and understand it, and we have a strong operations officer, a operations group officer, you know, is that something that may be possible in the future? Yeah, thanks for a question. Yeah, actually, we already have that, right? Air base wing commanders. Right, they're responsible that are actually today responsible for the, uh, the installation. Um, it matters not whether they're rated or non-rated, right? So we actually have, and we have a lot of a functional wings across our Air Force. Here's something we're looking at, though. Uh, I went, you know, I, I, I shared with you that 
because we've been fighting a mature fight with mature infrastructure, with mature basing, with mature C2, I could actually have be organized differently at home than I am forward. So I could have an in-garrison organization that then produced ready airmen that I could pull in individual or small groups and send them forward, and then when they arrived, they would roll in on existing squadrons, wings, groups, right, bases that are established, Al-Dapra, Al-Udeed, all of these bases that we have, Kandahar, Bagram. I don't think the next fight is going to allow that. So the question that I'm asking is, how do we need to be organized at home so that what I do every day at home mirrors what I'm going to do when I deploy forward? That's why you may see that we're doing an experiment at Mountain Home right now. Uh, let me tell you what the experiment is not. We're just looking at this organizational model for joint war fighting. Uh, this is not a discussion about you know, whether ops and maintenance need to be together, because I, I will tell you as the chief, uh, I've seen it both ways, and it works both ways. right? So I'm not going down the path of re-looking at that. What I am looking at, though, is how do I take, what is, how do I need to be organized at home? So if I tell that wing commander to go forward to a base in Poland, or a base in Estonia, or a base you name the place, right? And I say, your job now is to receive follow-on forces, fight your base, and be able to project power as you defend that base. What am I doing to develop that commander today at home so that he or she has that capability forward? So that's what we're looking at today. But there are, there are actually a lot of opportunities across our Air Force for non-rated uh, to be able to command at the wing level. Thank you. Thank you, sir. We'll go to the center. Good afternoon, sir. Uh, yeah. Captain Matt Skeens from Battle Creek, Michigan. Yeah. And uh, just to plug for the 217 for the service retained JTF capability, we wanted yeah. in Battle Creek. Uh, we've been working hard on that. Yeah. Um, you talked about the different domains that the Air Force is looking at. One of the domains that you didn't mention is information, yeah. is developing information operations. One of our adversaries is really good at that and kicks us in the teeth every chance they get. Can you talk a little bit about how we're going to develop that as an Air Force? Yeah. So uh, one of the things that we do are working at is we're looking at 24th, 25th Air Force uh, as our information warfighting numbered Air Force. Because we've looked at both, you know, what does it look like if you keep cyber, you know, if, if cyber and intelligence, surveillance, reconnaissance are, are separate organizationally, you know, what happens when we actually pull them together and we look at that through the lens of information warfare. And I wouldn't call it information dominance because it's more about almost information parity. Because as you said, we have both those that are out there operating in the information spaces. And as long as we are encumbered by this thing called the truth, because we actually go to war with our values and we don't leave them at home, and we speak the truth, because that's what our nation and the international community expects, that's always going to make it a challenge in the information domain. So we're looking at 24th, 25th Air Force in terms of how we bring that together. And it's a combination of cyber, intelligence, and electronic warfare. And how do you take the, bring those three uh, capabilities together and place them in an organization that can actually work across and, and cross seams and close seams so that we can actually improve in the business of information warfare? We're looking at the air staff and looking at uh, the construct of the, that the Navy has worked through, and they have an N26, right? Intelligence and cyber information warfare that they put together. Um, we're actually looking at that same model going forward because if, if in fact, uh, as we project power forward and we look at the, the components that are going to work together the most, a lot of what we're going to do going forward is going to be uh, Air Force and Navy, Army pushing forward together in the information domain spaces. So we're doing that together. We're trying to get the phone book aligned, right, so that's under a single uh, component. That component is staffed to be able to do information warfare and then we report to a single to all the combatant commands with an organizational model that makes sense. So those are all under the works right now. Thanks. Thank Sir, it looks like we have two questions left to your right. If it's okay, we'll take yeah. those last two and close out. Great. Captain Keith D. Augustine with the Utah Air National Guard Intelligence Officer. Uh, my question is in regards to your comments about readiness and additional duties. 
if you came to a drill weekend out in Utah, um, you would see that uh, airmen, um, a, a healthy percentage of airmen are involved in the drug testing program, mm. either to administer it or to randomly be selected to participate in it. Is the Air Force looking at um, reforming the drug testing program to reduce the burden it places on the squadron to enable us to focus more on readiness? Yeah, it's a good question. Uh, we're not right now, but I'll tell you, I'll, first of all, I'll go take a look at it because I've not looked at it through the lens of the burden on the squadron. But I would just uh, tell you that it's above an Air Force level uh, issue, right? All the services have the same program. That's a, that's a DOD-wide uh, program that's mandated in terms of how we administer that program. It has congressional oversight uh, in terms of how we administer that program. So we're not looking at doing any kind of a uh, standalone changes within the Air Force because it's not within our authority to do so. But I will take that on for you and look at sort of where we are in our smaller squadrons and the burden it places. And if there's a better way to do it, I'm all ears and we'll look at it. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Chief, Captain uh, Reed Kobernick, uh, Nevada Air National Guard, just a common C-130 tech airlifter. Yeah. So we go out there every day and we work with our uh, joint partners, our regular Air Force partners, our international partners uh, to increase lethality and interoperability. And we do all of this, as you know, in a, in a time where we have significant challenges with retention, especially in the pilot corps. Uh, I've noticed some lack of parity between the regular Air, Fa Air Force and the reserve components, uh, specifically in if we were to go out and fly a mission, OCONUS delivering supplies to the warfighter, my crew's spouses aren't able to space A on those flights because they're not, uh, they're prohibited from doing so, OCONUS. Uh, flight pay is another area. Uh, my regular Air Force partners, my friends, they make a full month of flight, full month flight pay whether they fly or not. My co-pilot can go out and fly 20 days, a week, 20 days a month and he makes $6.20 for every day he flies. That's two thirds of a, uh, of a month of flight pay. Do you see any, uh, any movement forward on policy that balances fiscal responsibilities and uh, some parity between the, some more parity between the reserve and active duty force in terms yeah. of benefits and? Yeah, you know, I, again, uh, I'll go take a look at it with, uh, with General Rice. I mean, we'll, we'll, we'll take a look at it. Um, one of the things we gotta do is, you know, for me, uh, when someone, when we look at how we recruit and retain, part of this is re recognizing that anyone who keeps the United States Air Force uniform on uh, is a win for the United States Air Force. So uh, I'm one that uh, we're looking at, for instance, all the way from recruiting to retaining at the end, right? For recruiting, we're doing some pretty creative work because one of the questions I asked was, why do I have two recruiting offices in the same strip mall, right? One that says Air Force and one that says Air National Guard, right? Why don't we give recruiters credit for recruiting airmen? And if someone walks in and says, hey, this is my life situation, this is what's going on, and uh, the active duty person is there as a recruiter, says, you know what? You're a perfect fit for the Air National Guard. Let me bring you in. And if the Air National Guardsman is talking to someone, they says, hey, I really want to come in, I want to do full time, and you know, you're a perfect fit. And so we're looking at the recruiting rules, regulations, oversight, in terms of how we do that, and I think we're making some great strides. On the retention piece, um, I'm, I'm, we're actually looking at some really creative ways to offer incentive packages to folks for, to stay longer. And it's not as easy as saying, well, gosh, I'll just, increase the, the, I'll just increase the commitment. Because that actually reduces the incentive for folks to come in, right? I'm actually looking at possibly, could I actually reduce the commitment for full time, but increase the overall commitment by asking them to do some part time when they come in? So we actually recruit with a total force package. And we sign folks on for a, for a time frame where they will contribute in both full-time and part-time. And how do we make the, the, the transition in a career in this one Air Force, how do we make the transition between, between components easier? How does someone who gets to a certain point in their career who wants to transition from full-time to part-time, that's a, that's a win. So how do we make that easy 
And if they get to that point in their, in their life where they say, you know what, I no longer want to be part-time, I want to come back on full-time. I'd like to go full-time in the active duty or the guard. How do I make that easy? And so we've got initiatives that we're working on, General Rice and I, and all of that. We're making some progress. Some of the areas where we're having the most challenge is where it's, uh, it's congressionally mandated, right? So that, so that the color of money is set such that it makes it a little bit more difficult. But we've got, you know, you heard Secretary Mattis. Uh, we've got a lot of support on the Hill right now going forward. And uh, I think now's the time for us to make some progress. So we'll take a look at it. Great. Thank you for your time, sir. Thank you. Thank you all. Sir. On behalf of all members of our association and the National Guard, we want to thank you for your leadership, the example you set, and the sacrifice that you and your family make. Thank you very much, and we look forward Thanks, to having you again. Thank Thanks, you, sir. sir. You. Sergeant at Arms, please escort our guests from the podium. All right, it's been a great day. Everybody, we appreciate your time and your patience as we work through the day. Some great speakers. Please enjoy your time here, but watch out for each other. And have a great evening and network, network, network while you're here. We'll see you guys tomorrow. Oh, and one alibi. If there's a lieutenant colonel in the house that does not have his uh, headgear, we have an extra headgear that was turned into the table here. <laughs>